Hi, this is Lily DeHoyas Anderson, and you're listening to Choosing Glory. This is part two of chapters 7 through 12 in Helaman. So I really appreciate your joining me, and um, of course, send feedback about how this works for you, but maybe if it's a little bit more contained, it doesn't take so long to listen to the whole episode, that might be easier for some. I don't know. might be less convenient for others. I'm open to feedback, but I might break it up a little bit sometimes. Okay, we're in chapter nine here, and... You know, Nephi has been given this vision that that he knows that the chief judge is lying in his blood on the throne, killed by his own brother. And the crowd, having been a little stirred up here, says, okay, well, let's send five guys to check. So they go to check. And when they see that Nephi was exactly right, and he's been prophesying about all their sins and everything, so they're, you know, kind of hits home in a hurry that Nephi is a prophet and they fall to the earth And then when others come, they think, oh, these must be the guilty guys who killed the chief judge. So they imprison them. And then, let's see if we get to chapter 9. So, you know, they say, well, that's not it, but they're seen as possibly guilty. And then it talks about how they were afraid that all the judgments would come against them, and that's why they passed out and so on. But then later on, when there's a big burial feast or, you know, celebration to bury the chief judge and the whole you know, country or citizens are gathered together for that event, some people are like, well, what happened to those five guys? Like, did they ever come back? Because apparently this was true that he was killed. But like, what happened to those men? And (laughs) this is verse 12 of chapter nine. And they answered and said, concerning these five whom you say you've sent, we know not, but there are five who are the murderers and whom we have cast into prison. (laughs) So gee, coincidence, you think like, well, we don't know where those five, but there are five and that's where they are in prison. So they are brought and they kind of clarify what's been going on. But then because these are Gideon and robber leaders, right? So what do they do? Nephi must have done it. He must have agreed with somebody to slay the judge and then pretend to prophesy about it, whatever. And that's verse 16. So they bind Nephi and they cause that he should be taken about. That's verse 19. And Nephi says unto them in verse 21, O ye fools, ye uncircumcised of heart, ye blind and stiff-necked people, do ye know how long the Lord your God will suffer you that ye shall go on in this your way of sin? In other words, God gives a lot of latitude to his people. He gives us lots of time, but then there is a moment where it is everlastingly too late where destruction comes, the fulfillment of the prophecies descends. Now, brothers and sisters, we have seen that God always gives an escape clause. Throughout scripture, we see this. Like, think about Jonah going to Nineveh. And ironically, Jonah's not even happy about the escape clause. But God sends him to tell those people to repent or they'll be destroyed. And they listen and repent and they are not destroyed. So anytime God sends a prophet to tell us that we could be destroyed or that certain people could be destroyed, there's always an escape clause. If you repent, you can be forgiven, but you have to come to Christ and you have to change. Remember, the best synonym of repentance really is change. You can't continue in your ways of sin. You have to become a better version of yourself and ourselves. We need to become better versions of ourselves. So anyway, he says, okay, I'm going to give you another sign. And he tells them to go. It's the brother of the chief judge. Go to see Sientum and he'll say this. And then you say this. And eventually you'll see that there's blood on his cloak and you'll confess. And that is exactly what happens. And we're still in chapter nine, verse 36. Then shall he say, so this is still his prophecy unto you that I, Nephi, know nothing concerning the matter. So in other words, there was no conspiracy to kill the chief judge that I was a part of. I didn't set this up. He's going to say, I did it and I was alone in my crime, or at least it wasn't Nephi that was involved. So anyway, but what happens at the end of this chapter again shows how unsteady these people are. Because some people say, well, he's a prophet. And others say, well, he's a god. You know, I mean, they... They're all over the place. And of course, we're going to see that a lot of people reject him in a moment. So chapter 10, verse 1, it came to pass there was a division among the people. Shocker. Like, (laughs) once again, they're going to be, they're going to be divided. And so they go each way and Nephi is left alone. He's like, okay, whatever. Like, they're still not really repenting. And in verse 3, he's pondering, being much cast down because of the wickedness of the people of the Nephites, their secret works of darkness, etc., And here comes a voice to him. Now, this voice goes from verse 4 to 11, and it's worth 
pondering these beautiful words that come to Nephi. It's the voice of the Lord. Starting in verse 4, Blessed art thou, Nephi, for those things which thou hast done. And then here's a really wonderful word that's coming up. For I have beheld how thou hast with unwearyingness. Unwearyingness. You know, that's, that's really impressive. I mean, sometimes I really feel weary in the journey. And I'm inspired by Nephi's unwearyingness that even though he was sorrowful and we can have our moments of distress and sorrow and grief and pain, but God does want us to continue unweary, to do the things that we're called to do, to choose him, to choose the covenant path, all of these things. He's telling us he gets the weariness, but we can overcome through Christ if we you know, hang on, sometimes hanging on by our fingernails or by a very thin thread. I mean, I, I have had that feeling, but I try to keep coming to the fountain of living waters and be restored and replenished. It can take a long time to feel that full replenishment, but I don't want to be weary. Or let me put it this way, I don't want the weariness to take over. I don't want that to define my life. I want to be unwearying in my continuation, in my following the Lord. So he has declared the word with unwearyingness, and thou hast not feared them, and hast not sought thine own life. It's pretty high level that he didn't worry about his own comfort or well-being or agenda or desires or goals for his life. I'm not saying we can't have positive directions and that we shouldn't have positive directions and goals, but he didn't let those get in the way of God's calls. So I know many of us have had this experience of like, we thought we would be going a certain way and then God directed us a different way. And it wasn't what we would have considered our choice, except that our choice was to follow God's will. And once we invited him into our lives, he did direct us and we get to choose to obey his path, not our own, not to seek our own priorities or agendas other than the ones that God has declared and invites us to employ and manifest in our own lives. Thou hast sought my will and to keep my commandments. And now because thou hast done this with such unweariness, behold, this is verse 5, I will bless thee forever, make thee mighty in word and deed, faith and works, even that all things shall be done unto thee according to thy word. Now, this is an amazing gift. Nephi is getting ultimate priesthood power. It seems to me that at the very least, he is sanctified here. But honestly, more likely, I think he's getting his calling and election made sure. I think he has met the conditions. Either way, God is giving him this incredible priesthood power. And why does he get this power? Is it because he had good ideas on his own? Because he exercised personal authority? Or was it because of what God says? Thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. I've talked about this a lot, but I think it's such an important theme that even Christ, who was the most intelligent of the pre-earth spirits, who attained godhood prior to even having a mortal body, didn't do anything of his own will but he did the will of his father. Not because he didn't have good ideas, but because he allowed himself to be consumed by the will of the father, to totally give his agency back to God, who was the author of agency. That's the path, brothers and sisters. It's the path Nephi followed. And so God says, yeah, I can give you ultimate power because you're only going to do what I want you to. Your will and my will are going to be exactly the same, not because I'm following you, but because you're following me and because you have in total humility submitted to my will. You're not vaunting your own talents or strength or whatever. You're consecrating them to my will, to my work, swallowed up in the Father's will. I think there's a great Elder Maxwell speech about that. And that's the path of Christ that he set for us. So anyway, he gives him this great power and says, whatsoever, verse 7, ye shall seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven. These are sealing powers that go beyond the binding of families together, but actually seal things on earth 
for the people. So he gives examples of the power that God is giving him and what God can do. You know, if you say cast down a mountain, you know, or smite this people, whatever, it's going to happen. And now go and declare to these people again the message. Thus saith the Lord God, who is the Almighty, except ye repent, ye shall be smitten even unto destruction. Go back and tell them again. Nephi has spent so much of his adult life doing this, perhaps his own entire adult life, but he is told by God, go do it again. Now, how many of us would have said, like, well, I've heard it already. I've used every word I could think of. I, have, I went on the tower in my backyard. I, you know, was accused of this murder. Anyway, what does he do? It says he doesn't even go home. He doesn't continue to his destination, which was to go home and maybe rest or whatever. But no, he doesn't stop and he goes. He did not go into his own home, but did return into the multitude and began to declare unto them the word of the Lord. So... Okay, I'm so motivated and inspired by this. Now I just need a little more energy, but I am trying, right? But I want to be like Nephi, both Nephi's, but I want to be like this Nephi too, where I, I'm unweary in pursuit of obedience and in doing the will of the Lord, and I don't get deterred by my own destinations. <laughs> anyway... What did they do? They did harden their hearts. And so it's not like it's rewarded immediately with, you know, people listening and repenting. But Nephi declares, except you shall repent. This is verse 14. You'll be smitten to destruction. And they hardened their hearts in verse 15, would not hearken. And they're murderous again. So the spirit in verse 16 has to convey him out of their midst. He's taken by the Spirit to protect him from their murderous intent. And so he goes forth in the Spirit, and he still goes and continues from multitude to multitude. Verse 17, this is chapter 10 near the end, and they did not hearken. And then they become so contentious and divided as a people. They're wicked people, and of course, iniquity breeds anger and hatred and destruction. And what do they do? They were divided against themselves and began to slay one another with the sword. This is the Nephites who are now just having this battle within their citizenry, and they are killing each other with the sword. Chapter 11, Nephi sees this, and he's like, I don't want those people to perish by the sword. And he uses the power that God has given him to ask for a famine in the land. So there's a drought and there's no rain and the crops dry up and whatever and people go hungry. And in the more wicked parts of the land, it tells us that thousands perish, but people perish throughout the land. And you know who dies first in a famine? Typically, it's women and children. So, you know, I'm not saying, I don't know how innocent any of them were, but children certainly you know, often are caught up in these things. We do know that young children prior to the age of accountability, are saved in the kingdom of God, in the celestial kingdom. So God has a plan for those who suffer innocently in situations like that unto death. But, And I'm sure others who are innocent are given the same grace if it's truly not their choice to be rebellious against God. But, I mean, it's tough on a whole land to be in such severe famine. And finally, in verse 7, and it gets right to the point where they think they're going to perish by famine, they began to remember the Lord their God and remember the words of Nephi. Now, I find this fascinating. I don't know if I understand it, but in verse 8, it says they go to their leaders. Remember, the leaders are Gadian types. But they say, will you go to Nephi and say, we know you're a man of God, and please ask God to turn this famine away from us so that we don't just all die. And the judges go to Nephi. And maybe they were repentant, maybe not. Anyway, as the people had asked them to, they do. And when Nephi saw that the people had repented, this is verse 9, and did humble themselves in sackcloth, he cried unto the Lord and asks him to, to release the famine and to send rain. Now, it's interesting because, you know, again, this is a condensed version, but his prayer begins in verse 10, this people repenteth and they have swept away the band of Gideon from among them. So sorry, scratch what I said about the judges. They must have elected judges who are no longer Gideon robbers. And they go to those judges and say, can you go to Nephi and petition him to petition the Lord to end the famine? So they had taken care of the Gideon robbers. So again, this is a pretty condensed version. They're about to die of famine, but they must have then turned and 
try to clean up their society. And he asks that the Lord will turn this away. And sure enough, rain comes in verse 17, and they begin to prosper again because and they rejoice and glorify God. And then this is the verse in 19 of chapter 11 that tells us, Behold, Lehi, his brother, the brother of Nephi, was not a whit behind him as to things pertaining to righteousness. So these are amazing men. And as I pointed out last time, take heart, you parents. <laughs> You know, just because Babylon is raging and, and Satan is raging as prophesied doesn't mean we can't raise believing children. Uh, there are a lot of oppositional forces against our children. And if they stray from the faith, we've talked about promises that come to covenant-keeping parents. So this isn't, you know, trying to say it's inevitably going to go just one way. But take heart. Some children will receive the word of the Lord in their youth, even in times of wickedness. And those that lose their path, we cling to our covenants and blessings will come through us to our posterity. And that we are reminded of that every time we go through the veil in the temple. And I hope those words mean as much to you as they do to me when I hear them. So these two brothers are amazing, even during a time when basically the whole country just, you know, keeps going south. Okay, but this is just amazing, again, how quickly it turns, because in verse 22, it talks about they were, you know, they had peace, except for a few contentions concerning the points of doctrine, which had been laid down to the prophets. Is that ringing a bell? There are so many contentions on YouTube concerning doctrine. Like, there are a lot of people who are, like, you know, arguing, not arguing, but presenting their, well, maybe some of it is argument, or at least debate about the words of the prophets. And brothers and sisters, let's not go there because it leads to trouble. And in the next verse, there was much strife. So it goes from these contentions about doctrine, all of a sudden there's much strife. And it came to pass that Nephi and Lehi and many of their brethren who knew concerning the true points of doctrine, therefore they did preach unto the people insomuch that they did put an end to their strife in that same year. So they are able to extinguish the problems that by preaching. I skipped a phrase I'm going to come back to later. But then again, there are dissenters in verse 24. They go to the Lamanites, they stir them up and commence a war with the Nephites again. The dissenters go and there are sadly useful idiots that will be manipulated and utilized by these wicked people who, as we read about in Malachi, that wicked dissenter who becomes king of the Lamanites and others, and now in this time too, that go and stir up a group who otherwise would not do these things, but they are manipulated and utilized by the wicked to create so much destruction. And again, in verse 26, the space of not many years, there becomes another huge band of Gadianton robbers. And they send out an army of strong men, it mentions in verse 28, and they're beaten back. And the next year they try again, and they go forth to try to eliminate the robbers. But the robbers, in verse 32, did still increase and wax strong. Now, Mormon doesn't put it in here because he's put it in here again and again. Why can they not defeat the Gadianton robbers? Because they're not sufficiently repentant. Because it doesn't matter if it's what the numbers are. God can take a small group and defeat a large group. This has happened again and again. He can take the people of Gideon. 300 soldiers of Gideon against the Midianites and the Amalekites that were like as numerous as grasshoppers on the field. And he can give them the victory because it comes through God and our dependency on him and our acknowledgement of our dependency on him. And if we do, God strengthens us and magnifies us. Otherwise, we're left to our own strength. These people, the strong men, could not defeat the Gadianton robbers because they didn't incorporate God. They didn't invite God into their lives through righteousness and repentance. And so this great evil comes, and they finally, because the Gadianton robbers are getting worse, they, they remember the Lord their God. This is the end of verse 34. And thus ended the 80 and first year, and then in the 80 and second year. They began to forget the Lord, their God. One year. It's not even like two years. It's one year they go from remembering God to forgetting God. And then in the next year, they begin to wax strong in iniquity. So, I mean, the rapid turnaround, again, I'm just reminding all of us that, like, how set are we upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ? Or are we sort of opportunistic in our faith? <laughs> I mean, isn't that what's going on here? Is this sort of opportunism 
where like until we're really desperate, we're not gonna think about God. But when we are desperate, we'll remember God just for long enough to get out of the worst distress, and then we'll forget him again. There's so much opportunism in there. It also demonstrates again and again that signs are not what develop faith. Like they saw this sign of the chief judge, the prophecies that Nephi made, you know, exactly how the brother would confess, all that kind of stuff. And that doesn't make them faithful. It's obedience that builds faith, has to be exercised into obedience, into repentance. You know, it's faith in Christ, repentance, you know, following the commandments, seeking the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what builds strength, is being on that path and following God's pattern. Not just like, wow, that was pretty impressive for a moment, or we're dying from famine, or the Gadiant robbers are taking over again and we can't seem to defeat them. <sighs> faith in Christ is a serious business, and it's not to be opportunistic. <laughs> that's just... That's pretty, that's pretty pathetic, isn't it? So I'm going to come back to that idea at the end of our discussion today, but I think it's just a build up to chapter 12. And Mormon gives an incredible treatise in chapter 12 that I hope we refer to often, that we reread regularly, that we contemplate seriously, that we actually, you know, read this with, with an eye to ourselves, asking the Lord to reveal to us our weaknesses so that we can overcome them through Christ. Brothers and sisters, this chapter is amazing. If we're arrogant, it's a great one to read. If we are struggling with pride, you know, we could come back here and hopefully accept the incredible depiction of the instability of humankind. I mean, how as it says in the heading here, men are unstable and foolish and quick to do evil. The Lord chastens his people. The nothingness of men compared with the power of God in the day of judgment, men shall gain everlasting life or everlasting damnation. There's a pretty complete summary of this chapter. And the words of the prophet Mormon here, taken from these records and summarized or condensed, are so powerful. And you can only imagine, and that's actually why I wanted to make sure I was correct on the authorship here, because I was thinking, you know, whose words are these? And though they are Mormons, he was taking them from records from these great men, Nephi and Lehi and other good men of the time, who, who loved the people, but sorrowed for their sin. And you can just imagine seeing that kind of revolving door on their righteousness. Like they, they just weren't stable. You know, just keep going around the same stupid bush. You know, like, okay, when we're in desperation, we'll finally turn to God. And then next, as soon as we can, we'll forget him. Like this is the natural man to a T. And if we stay in that telestial state, if we don't help our children be sufficiently motivated to harness their natural man, and we can do that. We've got those parenting videos, brothers and sisters. That material is useful if we apply it because we handle the resources. We can incentivize our children by appropriate use of those resources to help them harness their natural man. And we need to be more stubborn than they are about that process because there is so much out there pulling on their natural man, elevating the natural man in our society, elevating it in, in any life. You know, you can have it all. Why should you wait? You, you know, you don't need to be good. You don't need to repent. You don't need to sacrifice anything. You don't need to give up anything. And you can have your cake and eat it too. That's the society they're growing up in. But we can teach them differently. And even if they depart for a while, the Lord has made some amazing promises to covenant-keeping parents. Don't lose your faith and hope in Christ for your children. But teach them all you can. And talk about chapter 12. This is an amazing chapter. Okay, before I get into some of the words of chapter 12, which I'm not going to spend too much time on because it's so beautiful, but I do want to talk about that phrase that I skipped in verse 23. So kind of reading again, this is Helaman 11, verse 23. Nephi and Lehi and many of their brethren who knew concerning the true points of doctrine, and then this is the phrase that I skipped, it's a little aside, having many revelations daily, therefore they did preach unto the people. 
having many revelations daily. I remember that, anyway, seems eons ago now, reading through the Book of Mormon, that that phrase just sort of leapt off the page, and I thought, what was that again? Having many revelations daily. Okay, that's a sanctified life, brothers and sisters, where we have tuned in to that voice. So remember, we've talked about this many times. Heber C. Kimball's prophecy, the day will come when no man can stand on borrowed life. We've talked about the fact that we're in an age of such abundant information and so little truth. It is so hard to know. Who's speaking without an agenda? I mean, is anybody anyway in, in our media and all the adversarial things that are part of our society that stir people up? And <laughs> May the Lord protect us from being useful idiots. And then there are so many mysteries in our current situation as the stressors of the last days seem to compound, right? So, you know, I talk to people all the time who, and hear from my children about their friends and their acquaintances who are struggling with some really serious questions. Not that people haven't throughout the history of the world had questions, but there's a lot of confusion in our day. I think it's really hard and maybe it's cycled around and it's happened in other days too, but I think we are definitely in a time where deception is so prevalent and there are so many lies and there are so many falsehoods that are being touted and unapologetically as the truth, you know, good is called evil, evil is called good. People just are so brazen about it. In fact, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, we're living in a world where these secret combinations aren't secret anymore. <laughs> They're so brazen. They're so bold. I mean, it's sort of incredible how lies are just treated as commonplace and repeated and repeated. And of course, this is the whole idea of propaganda, right? If you repeat the, a lie often enough, some, again, Lenin's phrase, useful idiots are going to believe it. They're not going to examine it. Critically, they're not going to think about the implications or the repercussions or how well does it pass the litmus test of truth? How well does it line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ? They're just going to like swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And it, like I said, it's, it's really not secret combinations in our day. I mean, I guess that's the term we use, but they don't seem that secret anymore. It's so bizarre, right? You know, so many things that even that, you know, the church has really made a point. Our leaders, our prophet. President Nelson has made such a point of asking us to hear the Lord and learn to hear him and not be moved, not be manipulated, not be falling for, for foolish ideas or ideologies, but to be able to be firm on the rock of our Redeemer. So, I mean, look at all the different opinions on modesty, how we dress. And I mean, what we read in that news article about that, you know, the Lives of Mormon Wives, I mean, I even hate to designate that title or dignify it with even a mention, but you know, I, we're in a confusing world and people, you know, hear those things and sometimes, again, swallow the lies. But yeah, within our membership, we got people touting that kind of stuff, acting like that we need to just accept that we are more diverse than we think. You know, I'm just like, oh, please, here we are, you know, so far from Zion but not if in our own lives and our own hearts we are committed to that path. Honestly, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a point at which there are enough of us who have dedicated ourselves to that path of thinking celestial, being obedient, submitting our will to God's, living a more celestial life, choosing glory, and we will prepare. If enough of us prepare like that, the day will come when Zion will be established, and that will give us a refuge from all this madness. But I'm just going to mention a couple of other things. Sorry if I'm overdoing this, but look at even just like health and nutrition. Can we just can we just talk about that? That's sort of a neutral topic, right? Except in the same 24-hour period, of course, this is not the first time this has happened. This has been happening for decades now. But this was just kind of ironic that it happened within the same day that I saw one little ad about you know, blueberries are so good for you. And then another one that said, stop eating blueberries and your health will really improve. So you're just kind of like, like, where do you go? Like, where do you go to know what's good for you? And we have a lot of people struggling with health issues. And, you know, we've said our food isn't even as nutritious as it used to be. Our poor Mother Earth, who can't even 
supply the nutritious food that she is designed to supply because of um, just this weariness, the bad stewardship, and and also, of course, most of all, the iniquity, because God could give us all the abundance around the world if we were righteous as a people. But okay, back to just who do you listen to? What if you've got health issues and you go to doctors and you hear all these different voices? Well, you know what? We go to our knees. I remember, and so do you probably, that story from Hans Mill, where that boy's hip was shot off by one of the mob members. And he wouldn't have been able to walk again, but his mother, through the inspiration of the spirit, put sawdust, I think, in there and closed up the wound or whatever, and it kind of created some sort of cartilage or whatever, and he was able to walk for the rest of his life. It was truly a miracle because God inspired that mother with information she could not have had herself and couldn't have had time to try to study out and who knows what differing opinions she would have encountered, but the spirit told her what to do and she was able to bless her son through that inspiration. I don't mean to make this glib. I know there are trials in our lives that the Lord allows to continue for a period and for a season and that they can be, if we let them be, consecrated for our gain and a part of our process of sanctification. However, we should not fail to ask the Lord and see if there is a season where he is willing to give us additional guidance as to how to proceed with problems that may be beyond the information that we can reliably receive through these many contested voices that are, are all around us. Please understand, I'm not saying not to use the blessings of of our day and that we can't consult. I certainly am going to doctors myself to try to get help with some things, but, and we always have, but I think more and more we, we need to hear the Lord. What do we do when our children are losing faith? How do we deal with our broken hearts? Again, we need to go to the Lord and let him teach us how to share our burden with him, how to praise him in times of difficulty, how to be grateful in our trials, how to increase our faith and deepen our hope. I've heard so many people concerned about their children and their in-law children, and some of them are leaving the faith and they're concerned about what that does to their grandchildren and to their own children who are in those marriages and trying to hold on. Of course, the whole LGBT thing and these huge pushes to confuse our children about their very sex and their identity as a son or daughter of God. You know, what do we do? How do we approach those things? How do we respond? And every situation has its own unique characteristics. There are certainly some principles that might be involved, but brothers and sisters, we see more and more that like the need that exists for us to go to God and say, how do I proceed within the principles that I know are true within the gospel doctrines, but how do I move forward in this particular case or in this relationship with this loved person who, you know, I want to bless and, but where is, again, is the line and, and not to let tolerance overtake truth. Anyway, all of this, it needs to be guided by the spirit. And this is why it is so important to be on this path of sanctification, because at that point, we have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost and can receive many revelations daily. Let me just quote from President Nelson's terrific speech, Hear Him, in April 2020. And interestingly, of course, this was in the thick of COVID, right? And crazy things that were happening in our society. But here's what President Nelson said. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, consider the fact that, oh, he talks, I'm sorry, about three situations in history where God's voice, the Father's voice is heard, introducing the Son, remember, at his baptism, you know, for Joseph Smith, with Moses. Anyway, here is my beloved Son, hear him. And this, of course, is the admonition the prophet is passing along to us to hear him. So anyway, after mentioning those three occasions, he says, consider the fact that in these three instances just mentioned, just before the father introduced the son, the people involved were in a state of fear and to some degree desperation. I think that is such a comforting acknowledgement that the people who were about to be introduced to the son were in a state of fear and to some degree desperation. Certainly true. We hear that in Joseph Smith's story that he thought he would be destroyed. He was in imminent danger of destruction by the adversary. 
when this instruction and introduction to the Savior comes, and he is instructed by God the Father to hear the Son. Anyway, he says the apostles were afraid when they first saw Christ encircled by a cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, so that was where the apostles hear to the introduction to the Son and to hear him, right? The Nephites were afraid because they had been through destruction and darkness for several days, and we're just about to read about that in a few weeks. Joseph Smith was in the grips of a force of darkness just before the heavens opened. Our Father knows that when we are surrounded by uncertainty and fear, what will help us the very most is to hear his Son. Because when we seek to hear, truly hear his Son, we will be guided to know what to do in any circumstance. Now, this is a high bar, brothers and sisters, but we're talking about Zion. We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about choosing glory, choosing celestial glory and qualifying for the presence of the Lord himself. It is a high bar. But when we seek to hear, truly hear his son, we'll be guided to know what to do in any circumstance. So it is worth pursuing this path of sanctification of Zion living. As we seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ, this is a little later in the speech, our efforts to hear him need to be ever more intentional. It takes conscious and consistent effort to fill our daily lives with his words, his teachings, his truths. President Nelson reminds us that we can hear him through scripture, in the temple, through the words of the prophets, and then he says this beautiful thing. We also hear him more clearly as we refine our ability to recognize the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. This is the path to sanctification. It has never been more imperative to know how the Spirit speaks to you than right now. In the Godhead, the Holy Ghost is the messenger. He will bring thoughts to your mind which the Father and the Son want you to receive. He is the comforter. I am seeking that. I want that. I know that God has made this available to us. It's not, it's not without a consecrated effort, but he is the comforter and can heal us. He will bring a feeling of peace to your heart. He testifies of truth and will confirm what is true as you hear and read the words of the Lord. I renew my plea for you to do whatever it takes to increase your spiritual capacity to receive personal revelation. So what in our lives is getting in the way of that? And I've mentioned before that Wendy Watson Nelson, I don't know if she was married to the prophet yet or if it was before, but had been asked how she was able to seek the spirit or have the spirit in her life. And she said something along the lines of, I looked to see what was blocking the spirit in my life and I worked to eliminate it. That's a pretty good formula. You know, and we can be prayerful and thoughtful about what is it, what lack I yet, where am I preventing the communications of the spirit in my life to my mind and my heart, and let me work on that, let me address that and diligently work to improve line upon line, precept upon precept. This is a process. It is being steadfast and unwearying in this journey. And the Lord has promised us the answers will come. I'm going to do some extra content on another little thought here from chapter 12. But I just want to start and read a few verses here. <laughs> Mormon is laying it out. And he does it because he loves us. He is looking at our day. And he is loving us enough to include these wake-up calls. Verse 4, how foolish and how vain and evil and devilish and how quick to do iniquity and how slow to do good are the children of men. And I'm sure we hear the lament that Mormon read of Nephi's and Lehi's writings because this is what they saw. Look, I mean, the vacillation that was so intense and insane. How quick to hearken unto the words of the evil one and to set their hearts upon the vain things of the world. How quick to be lifted up in pride. How quick to boast and do all manner of that which is iniquity. And how slow are they to remember the Lord their God. And to give ear unto his counsel. What if we were quick to listen? What if we decided, I'm just going to be quick. I'm going to be seeking to find more ways to eliminate things that would block the spirit. I'm going to come into harmony with my Savior Jesus Christ and the teachings that he gives us and the commandments. I'm going to stop quibbling. I'm going to stop bickering. I'm just going to stop rebelling. Yeah, how slow they are to remember the Lord their God, give your just counsels, and how slow to walk in wisdom's paths. And remember, as Alma told Corianton, 
Learn wisdom in thy youth. Learn to obey the commandments of God. I mean, it's really a pretty simple formula. Behold, they do not desire, this is verse 6, that the Lord their God who hath created them should rule and reign over them, notwithstanding his great goodness and mercy towards them. And they do set it not his counsels. They think that they are smarter than God. Their idea is better. If I were in charge of the plan, I would make this adjustment and then it would be, you know, better anyway. We're so amazing in our arrogance sometimes as a human creature who is totally dependent on the Lord, on the Father for his mercies. They do set it not his counsels. They will not that he should be their guide. They want to have personal authority. And then these words are so sobering. Verse 7, how great is the nothingness of the children of men. Yea, even they are less than the dust of the earth. And let's go back to King Benjamin's speech. Remember, that's what he told the people, allowed them to move forward to sanctification, where they had no more desire to sin, but to good continually. That was a sanctified state. And why? It was because they recognized their own nothingness. Again, the formula is so repetitive. You know, it's so clear. The prophets tell us again and again, acknowledge, acknowledge that we are fully dependent on God and that he is the supreme intelligence. How about if we don't try to reinvent the wheel? Let's follow the plan. Let us trust in his ways and in our Savior, Jesus Christ. They are less than the dust of the earth. Verse 8, this is so poetic. For behold, the dust of the earth moveth hither and thither to the dividing asunder at the command of our great and everlasting God. I've mentioned this before, but the dust moves when God tells it to move. But his children sit there and often say, well, give me a good idea. Give me a good reason to do that. You better explain it first. You better prove things. You better, you better satisfy all my curiosity. And, and then you better remind me again tomorrow because I'm going to forget. You know, I'm just going <laughs> to gonna let my natural man be in charge. And if God wants me to harness my appetites, well, he's going to have to wait because I just want to get that dopamine rush. I just want to satisfy myself. And God isn't that important to me. I'm just going to serve the natural man, which gives power unto the adversary to come in and bind us with chains and lead us down into everlasting destruction. How foolish are we to choose the natural man over the commandments of God? that are all designed to give us advanced information of the path to completion, the path to ultimate joy. Yes, it's through tough territory. It's through the wilderness. It's through refinements that are chastening and humbling. And yes, it's a process that's not for sissies. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak. Well, let me scratch that last one. We're all weak. But we can become strong in Christ because he is mighty to save. So he can take our weakness and turn it into strength. If we come unto him with full purpose of heart, then it doesn't matter what our weaknesses are. They can be swallowed up in the atoning grace of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful section. I'm going to do a little extra content on verse 15, but I'm going to jump right now to the punchline of verse 23. Therefore, blessed are they who will repent and hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God, for these are they that shall be saved. I mean, it's repeated again and again throughout the doctrinal teachings of the church, through always the voices of the prophets and the whisperings of the Spirit, because God loves us and he wants us to come into him and be saved. Okay, last thought comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've mentioned him before. I know many of you know who he is. He was a German cleric at the time the Nazis rose in power in Germany and started the terrible events of World War II, where there was so much pain and destruction that came, again, from a few wicked men who have such power because they can control useful idiots. Let us not be among those easily manipulated, brothers and sisters. Let us be critical thinkers and cling to the truth. But here's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a very courageous voice at that time. And because of it, and he could have escaped to the UK. He had even been in America. And many of his friends and family said, you just should stay away because he was vocal. And he wrote very strongly against the Nazis. And he was not afraid of the consequences. And he wrote what was called a, a letter to the church, which kind of remonstrated with the German clergy and said, why are you not speaking out against this evil? One of his biographers, Eric Metaxas, who is a, a Christian in our day, 
and an author has written, as I said, he wrote a biographer of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he also wrote recently a book called A Letter to the American Church, where you know, he was talking about us and, and how we should stand against evil. Anyway, this courageous man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was imprisoned by the Nazis for most of the war, and just a few months before the war ended, he was executed by them, having been held in one of the camps. And a, a courageous and impressive follower of Christ. And this is one of his writings from a book that I did read some years back called The Cost of Discipleship. I've wondered if that title was kind of utilized and modified a little bit by our president, Jeffrey Holland, who a few years ago, as a member of the 12, gave a speech in conference called The Costs and Blessings of Discipleship. And it's a marvelous speech. I refer to it often. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book was called The Cost of Discipleship, and it's really touching. And this is from that book. He used the term cheap grace. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks wares. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury. Now that's, these words are beautiful, but you have to think about them. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury, like there's no, no end to this, from which she showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. We talked weeks ago about the conditions whereupon we can be saved. And those words are spoken by prophets. There are conditions. There is a straight and narrow path. There is a covenant path. Anyway, he's talking about people who weaken that message, who water it down and act as, as this is an inexhaustible, unconditional offering that is given to everybody without any kind of limits or conditions. Grace without price Grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance. And that is true. Christ did pay the price. And because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. And he's saying this is a false idea. Since the cost was infinite, the possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. What would grace be if it were not cheap? But he is saying that that is a false notion. Cheap grace, he continues, is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. And that is not the message of God. It is repent. Remember in the DNC how often it says, say nothing but repentance. That's all that the prophets are told to say. Even when the people don't listen, God says, say nothing but repentance, because there is a price to be paid for our portion of that grace. Now, I get that there are two things going on here. Everybody is saved by grace in that none of us will remain in the grave. So yes, grace is available to every single one of us because of the resurrection that Christ has given us through his own resurrection and through the plan of our Heavenly Father, but through the, the resurrection of Christ, all men will receive the grace of a resurrection. That is free. So there are portions of the atonement that are a free gift, but there are other portions again and again that we are told you can't be saved in your sins, just from your sins. And that's what he's talking about. Anybody who pays attention and actually reads scripture and all they had was the Bible. Here we have the gift of so much more scripture. Anyway, he understood this. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. Remember Christ's teachings of that pearl beyond price or the treasure that someone gives all that they own so that they can have this treasure. And here, here he goes. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. 
It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. I love that sentence. I'm going to read it again. It is costly because it costs a man or a woman his or her life. It is grace because it gives a man and woman the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Ye were bought with a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. This man was inspired, and I am grateful for what he has written here, and I'm grateful for the echo that it is of all that our prophets teach again and again and what is told us again and again in the scriptures. We can receive this grace, but there is there is a path that is to be followed, and it is following Jesus Christ without rebellion, without watering down the doctrines, without quibbling. Let us choose glory, brothers and sisters. Let us build Zion now and prepare the earth for the coming of Jesus Christ. We need the refuge of Zion before he comes. We don't have to wait until he is here again for us to be living at a Zion level. Now is the time. Now is the time to pursue this path of sanctification. I testify of the truthfulness of these things and of our Savior Jesus Christ, whose grace is available to us in the correct way that he has taught us. Thanks as ever to my beloved husband, Chris Anderson, and Doug Larson of Point Digital. Take care.